Hey folks, good evening. Um, if I could just get someone to uh, let me know if the signal's coming through and it's working, I'll check in uh, the live chat. So it's uh, 728 and my program tonight is winter camping. Cool. How's everyone doing? Hmm. While uh, we're waiting, uh, are there any questions? Get started shortly. Oh, we can hear me? All good. Great. Thanks. <clears throat> so I think there's about a one to two minute delay here. So it usually takes me a minute to see. And... Uh, just give her a minute and we'll be off and running. <clears throat> oh, I see. I've missed, I didn't change the title on this. This is uh, winter camping, it's not glacier travel. As you can see, we're not stuck in a crevasse. Uh, that's a snow cave in the background. Okay, so it's 7.30. Let's get going, shall we? Get rid of the crevasse part. All right, so winter camping, um, most of us are pretty familiar with camping in the summer, and in winter, <clears throat> it's not significantly different. The, uh, the basic concepts are the same. We're putting in a basic shelter. We have to cook. We have to care for ourselves. Where the differences come into play is... The temperature is a lot more severe. We need to be able to stay dry, which is surprisingly difficult. And uh, we have to keep things dry over time. And that uh, that's a lot harder than it sounds with winter. You'd think with snow that it's cold. But most of the moisture is actually coming from us. Um, when we work hard, we sweat. And as we sweat, there's moisture built up in our clothing. Uh, fabrics like Gore-Tex, they do allow moisture to get out, but they don't allow it to move all that effectively. And so one of the biggest factors, not just when you're going winter camping, but in the winter, is to dress in such a way that you don't freeze. But at the same time, your sweat and your moisture can escape pretty effectively and you don't become wet. Because despite all our advances in improved uh, clothing and fabrics, things get wet and they are a lot less uh, insulating will have a much lower insulating value when they are uh, when they're saturated and for a day trip that's not a big deal but if you're traveling for a weekend it starts to be a factor and if you're going on a long tour um, some of the big ski traverses can be over a week there's uh, ski tours that extend two weeks um, and then there's some programs where people travel for most of the winter just to uh, to complete their objective because they're doing hundreds or possibly even over a thousand kilometers and in those situations, you've got to be able to keep your gear dry. Or when it gets wet, dry it out. And that's one of the real challenges with winter camping. And so what I've done is I was out today shooting some video, and I apologize. This is not nearly as put together as I'd like it to be. But the basic information is there. And as time goes on, I'll get uh, more built in. But just, uh, just a limitation of my work schedule this week. So I didn't get out too much. So as you're approaching the scene, if you're going to set up a camp, one of the first things you want to do, if you can, is get below tree line and look for a good sheltered site. Trees can provide a lot more protection from the cold, and uh, they also help reduce uh, just the noise from the wind. If, uh, if you're familiar with, uh, with the wildlife, when conditions get cold, the wildlife moves into the trees. Even if there's less food there, they're trying to reduce the amount of heat loss. Trees work a lot like a blanket. They're insulators. And so this can make life a lot easier. Of course, if you're up on an ice field or you're doing a high traverse into the alpine, it's not a viable option, in which case you're going to look for a more sheltered site if you can find it. But whenever possible, try and get below tree line. It will make for a more pleasant evening. Check the area around your camp. Make sure that uh, there's no big trees or surrounding vegetation. 
that during a storm might get loaded and come crashing down. Um, you know, we think of uh, bears as being our biggest threat in the summer. They're not much of a concern in the winter, but, you know, the number of people killed by falling trees is actually triple the number of people killed by bears. So check your site. If it's snowing, that load is certainly going to increase the possibility of things come crashing down. And on more than one occasion, it's been the winds that have actually chased me out of the forest and out onto the open slopes because I was more afraid of, uh, of tree falls than I was about the, uh, the severe weather that we were in. So choose your site carefully, pack it down. Especially in the Rockies, the snowpack is kind of soft. And so you're going to need to take some time to pack it down and let the snow set. And if you're going to kick back and take a rest after you've finished packing it down nice and hard, be sure to sit on your pack. Don't sit in the snow, even if you're hot. And the simple reason is, if you're hot, you're going to melt the snow, you're going to get your clothes wet, and things are going to get worse. The way I pack my pack is I always make sure I have nothing fragile in the bottom of my pack, and any time I stop for a rest, I take my pack off, and I sit at the bottom end where the sleeping bag is. And that way I stay warm and dry. Because again, once you get wet, it's much, much hotter to, uh, to dry out. So that's one of the big things. Also, I'm not wearing a hat here. By all means, put on a hat, put your hood on just so you don't get as much snow in your hair. Those are all really good ideas. Okay. For tents, there are things that are called summer tents and winter tents. And to be honest, I haven't noticed a big difference in the design. The winter tents are supposed to be a little stronger and more robust. Um, unless you're planning to do some pretty severe high altitude mountaineering, I wouldn't worry too much about whether your tent is summer or winter. There are some other things I'd look for. One of the, uh, the big things for your tent is, especially with winter, go with metal poles. Okay? Metal poles are just stronger. They're more reliable. They age extremely well. The fiberglass poles become more brittle over time, and they're less flexible, yet they're also not as strong. The other thing you want is you want a tent that'll shed snow. So try to avoid tents that have really flat tops on them. They're getting better, but it uh, wasn't too long ago. You could still find tents that had some pretty significant flat areas on them, and as a result, water could pool or the snow would build up, and it wouldn't shed easily. So those tents are getting more weight, and in the summer, it's greater chance of leakage. The other thing you really want to look for in a winter tent are vestibules. Um, one vestibule is great, two vestibules are even better. But basically, a vestibule is sort of the uh, where the fly extends out beyond the tent, and it gives you a space to put your boots, possibly your pack, and some gear in the front of your tent, but not inside the tent itself. They're really nice to have because you don't have a lot of space. Okay. So, putting together the tent. Um, I have one of the old... Uh, dome tents. The other thing I like in winter is I like to use bigger tents. You've got a lot more gear, you're a lot more spread out, and you're going to be in the tent longer than you are in the summer. And so it is nice to have that space. It does cost you space in your pack, and it adds weight. If that's a real factor, by all means, go with the lighter tent systems. But be careful. Don't, uh, don't grab a tent. Um, that you just barely fit into. I usually like having a three-person tent for two people, and uh, if I'm going alone, I usually travel in a two-person tent, if I'm guiding and using my own tent. Just because it gives me room to place my gear and spread it out a bit, it's nice to have. It's not essential, but it's a nice thing to have some space for. I was up on the Columbia Ice Field a couple years ago in May, and there was two of us in this tent, and it worked pretty well. So, again, it's not essential. I did the six pass three or four years ago in a really tight two-person tent, and we made it work, but uh, it was very claustrophobic, and it was really actually kind of hard just to roll over. So once you got the basic friend of the tent up, nice thing about winter, is you don't have to worry about uh, the tent getting wet, so as long as the uh, bug mesh is out, you can leave your tent like this, and then you can start uh, putting all your equipment inside. This is easier than putting the fly over top and then squeezing through both, so just have it set up, get your Thermarest or your, uh, your mattress. Some of the mattresses that are using down, they recommend you don't blow into them because your moisture gets in there and the, the down gets more and more moist, starts to, to rot over time or become covered with mildew. But one of the big things is, is just your breath. 
this, the condensation can start to freeze things up. That's a significant factor in winter. So in those cases, use the little uh, pump that comes with them. It's nice to have a thicker foamy, a thicker pad, just for the simple reason um, it's going to, uh, you're going to need it for the cold. More insulation in winter, and where you're going to lose your heat the most is on the ground. So get a decent pad. A little bit thicker of an inflatable one is great. The old uh, foam, uh, what were they called? Um, oh, I can't even remember. A sleeping pad. The foam sleeping pad, they do work. Get a thicker one or get two of them if you want. The nice thing about those is you can't pop them, and so they don't leak. The downside is, is they're bigger, and they aren't quite as good an insulator for the, uh, the weight. But, you know, choose what works for you. So I just throw my big uh, down thermorest inside. So that was an expedition. I don't think they make it anymore. It has an insulator inside, and it's got a lot more space between me and the ground. And then, go grab your sleeping bag. And sleeping bags are kind of tricky in the sense that um, they can be uh, expensive. The best bags for winter, without a doubt, are down bags. They're very warm, they're very light, and they pack down well. Synthetic is not as warm, it does not pack down as well, and it's not nearly as durable. That blue bag that you're seeing me drag in, I purchased in 1990, and I've used it every winter since. And it's still a really good, reliable, warm down bag. So if you're going to spend a lot of money on a sleeping bag, remember it'll probably last you your lifetime. When I started winter camping, <laughs> it was in Boy Scouts, and I think I was 13 when I first started winter camping, and it was cold out. It would go to minus 20, minus 30 at night, and I would freeze. Um, but I had my father's old down bag, and that served me for the first 20 years. So a down bag will probably last you your life. In fact, if you really take really good care of it, you can pass it on to your kids. With the sleeping bag, remember, down does get wet and down does not dry well. One of the things you can do to make life better is to uh, don't wash it very often. It seems a little counterintuitive, but the oils on the feathers actually help give it some waterproofing and uh, make it, what's that called, hydrophobic. So it fights getting wet. And the more you wash it, the more the oil you take off of your down sleeping bag. Um, I'll wash mine every couple of seasons or if I've had a really long tour and I've been living in my sleeping bag, I gotta wash it. And when I do, I hand wash it and I'll use very, very gentle um, uh, detergent like Woolite. And then when I'm finished, it takes about two or three hours in the dryer before it's dry enough that I can start to hang it up. Be careful, they're very fragile when they're wet. And as I said, just don't wash them any more than you have to, and you'll get the best life expectancy out of them. So once you've taken care of the bag, I'm digging out in front of my tent. And the reason for that is it just makes it easier. I'm kind of in a sitting position when I go in and out of the tent. That's where I'm going to put my, uh, my ski boots when I go in. I can put my pack there. If I've got other odds and ends that I want to keep um, close by, but not necessarily in the tent, then I can use, uh, I can use that space. So it does make life a little easier. And now the fly and the vestibule come on. Some tents, the vestibule is separate of the fly, and this one, they're connected. Most tents, I think, just have one vestibule. Other tents, they might have two doors, a front and a back, and they may have two vestibules. So that gives you a bit more space. Um, space is good, but again, weight is a challenge. Okay. So, while I put uh, the tent together, um, what was I going to mention? Oh yeah, with the down sleeping bag, just put the down bag in as I did. Don't put a, a, um, a bivy sack or any kind of a tarp around your sleeping bag because the bag has to breathe. When I go in there, I go in there and I'm wearing the clothes I was skiing in during the day because on a longer tour, I can't af afford the extra weight of a separate set of clothes. But the other thing I'm doing is I'm also drying them out through the night with my body heat, and it works surprisingly well. However, the down bag has to be able to just keep drawing that moisture all the way out through it. And if you put a, 
a waterproof tarp or a Gore-Tex sack over top of it that really restricts its breathability. And so the bag gets wetter and wetter each night, which means you have less insulation and the bag becomes heavier and a lot more difficult to move with as it's frozen. Okay. That video is almost finished. Beyond that, um, the other thing you want to watch with the bag is um, what you put in it. My sleeping bag, I bought the longest one I could get because I'm a little taller than average. And things go into your bag to stay dry at night. Um, so for myself, I always put my, um, the liners from my boots inside the sleeping bag because if I leave them out, they're literally going to freeze into blocks of ice. And early on, a few times I did that, get up in the morning, put my liners on, go off ski touring, I'd almost have the feeling back in my feet and uh, know that I still had 10 toes by the end of the next day, just in time to stick them out and freeze again. So it is unpleasant. Put the liners in with your sleeping bag. They'll stay warm. They'll dry out a bit. And the next morning, they're a lot more effective. So keep that in mind. I also throw my water bottle in there for the simple reason. I don't want my water to freeze. And you may not be able to access the water you melted the night before because you've literally got a frozen water bottle. So things become a lot more sort of involved. Um, that's sort of the basics for the sleeping bag. Someone's asking about a recommended minimum R value for the sleeping pad. To be honest, I'm not sure if sleeping pads have R values. If they do, that'd be great. But I haven't bought one for a while. You know, kind of look at the type of sleeper you are and the kind of conditions you're willing to sleep outside in. Um, if you seem to be about an average person, in terms of being warm or cold and how well you sleep, then the recommended temperature ratings are probably pretty accurate. If you're an individual who just gets cold easily, you're going to need a sleeping bag that's warmer than what it's rated for. And even then, you're going to get cold. And then if you're someone who tends to be a bit hotter than average, then what you have going for you is you can get by with the lower temperature ratings and the lower R ratings. Doesn't mean you're having fun, but it does mean that, you know, you're able to function reasonably well and you're not freezing to death. For a while, you know, I could usually get by with a sleeping bag that was rated for 5 or 10 degrees uh, warmer than the environment I was in. So that worked out pretty nicely. And if I spend a lot of time outside, I'm pretty good with that. If I'm just starting my season, I'm a lot more fragile than that because I haven't built up any tolerance yet. And I remember one trip it was uh, in the summer and into the fall where I was gone for three and a half months living in a tent. And as I was coming back home, I had to hitchhike down because I was uh, 6,000 kilometers from where I started. And as I was coming down, I had to find a place to sleep at night. And in the evenings, I would literally just pull out my summer weight sleeping bag, which was absolutely trashed, and sleep outside. And it didn't bother me. One morning I woke up, there was 10 centimeters of snow on me. I was way outside my temperature rating. I was like, oh, this isn't so bad. Today, if you did, I did that, I would be freezing the entire night. So it's really tough to figure out what a good temperature rating is. See how you fit against average. And then how much time have you been spending outside and how comfortable are you? Because we do change and there is just some metabolic factors that make some people more tolerant and some people a lot less. Can you put um, multiple sleeping bags into each other? Sure. The challenge with that is they start getting bigger. But if you can pull that off, I used to use an overbag, a synthetic overbag over my down bag, and that helped, but it just made things so much bigger that in the end I, I left it. But if that works for you, by all means. Um, for a while, there was um, a school of thought about using a vapor barrier inside your sleeping bag. So none of your body moisture got into the down. You were kind of sealed up, kind of like a, a turkey basting. And it does work. It keeps the sleeping bag dry. But you are sleeping in basically uh, your own juices. And it gets pretty offensive after a couple of nights. It's not very pleasant. Um, you get pretty ripe pretty fast. However, it will keep your down dry. So... I gave up on that because after three or four days, it was just like, oof, okay, um, I'm going to kill somebody. Okay. Uh, consider two pads. Yep, 
You can absolutely go with whatever combination is going to work for sleeping pads. Part of it is insulation and part of it is comfort. In winter, it's really that's all about insulation. In the summer, comfort's a big factor. And when my spouse and I travel, we actually make a point of having some extra mats just because um, she's really not comfortable on the hard ground. I'm more reasonable or more tolerant of it. I don't know why. Um, so I'll use a thinner mattress. But yeah, work with whatever combination fits for you. Okay, and as I said, uh, firm pads, the uh, closed foam cells, they don't leak, they don't pop. However, they don't pack as well and they're not quite as warm. Yeah. Okay, so beyond that, I'm just going to check something out here because as I said, I was literally, it's done. Okay. I was literally working on another project. In fact, that's it rendering there while we were talking. So I have another video. Okay, I'm going to pause this. And I need you to tell me if you're seeing this screen. It should be a video of a hand placing a shovel blade in the snow. Anybody seeing that? I'll just wait here and see. Oh, yeah, it's working. I can see it on my end. Okay. We're good to go. What about liners? Yes, liners are basically the same idea, and they can help. Um, if the liner is a cotton liner, then it's going to get kind of unpleasant once it's moist and frozen. If it's a fleece or a, down, a fleece liner or something, yep, they can. They're a little bulky. There was a synthetic liner that my spouse used for a while that was designed with her sleeping bag. So it was a three season sleeping bag without the liner and a four season sleeping bag with the liner. And she really enjoyed that. So it can work. And thanks. Yeah, I'm seeing this. So the other real challenge with winter camping isn't just staying dry. It's getting hydrated. And most of what I do during the day, <laughs> or most of the time, most of what I'm doing when I'm not ski touring, um, on a multi-day tour or in winter camping is melting snow. You go all day, you come back to the tent and you melt snow. And you melt snow. And you melt snow. To give you an idea of how much snow I melt, um, when I'm traveling with a friend, so it's just my spouse and I, or I'm out with a partner and we're doing a trip somewhere just for the two of us, um, I estimate that I spend about two hours a day melting snow. That's just how long it takes. So this is another advantage of getting below tree line. If you can find a creek, dig through there, and if there's a fair bit of snow, it might actually be insulating the ice so it's not very thick. If you have an ice axe or you've got something fairly solid, even um, you know a, a knife or something, as long as the blade is well locked, see if you can chip through or find a weak spot and get to the water. Because if you can get creek water, that is so much easier to bring to a boil and take so much less time and less fuel than melting snow. Look for existing water. It's a huge asset. If you can't find existing water, your second best guess or your second best option is ice. Water or ice or water ice is, is a really strange beast. Um, as snow, it's a terrific insulator. And in fact, it's a really good way to stay warm up to about zero. Um, so it takes a lot of energy to melt snow because it's, an, it's got air in it, it's an insulator. However, ice conducts heat really well and so it is a great conductor and it melts fast. So use ice. If you can get ice, put ice in your pot and melt that. That's your best option if you can't get water. However, the problem is initially we got a stove. And stoves generate heat even from the bottom. And if you don't have something to uh, protect it, your stove is just going to melt through the snowpack, whoops, and into, uh, basically just keep going until your stove disappears. Have you ever built a fire on the snow and forgotten to build a really good platform of wood before you start the fire? The fire just melts its way down to the ground. And so if you're in the Rockies, it'll sink a meter. If you're in the Columbias, it'll sink so far you can't even see the, the flame anymore, and it's gone. Your stove's no different. You can buy these little uh, pads that uh, will attach to your stove, and that's all fine and dandy. You can take a quarter-inch piece of plywood, 
and that works beautifully too. However, um, I don't want to carry anything extra. So I use my shovel blade very often. It's not the most ideal surface, but it works and it's available. Uh, in terms of temper, it doesn't get that hot on your shovel blade. Like, you know, I could just, with my hand, grab the, the shovel when I'm finished cooking, and it's just warm to the touch, if that. So I'm not affecting the temper significantly, or at least I haven't noticed it. And I've been using my blades for 20 years, so there certainly hasn't been an issue with reducing strength. But that's a good question. You can also, as a question about compressing snow, yes. If you can find packed wind snow, wind slab, that also works pretty well. It's not as good as ice, but it's a lot better than loose, fluffy snow. And always try and start with water. So I'll get the stove going. This is an older style, an older style of stove. It uses white gas, and white gas is fine. Um, it's very, very high energy, high density fuel. It is probably, you know, pound for pound, the most efficient fuel we can take in the backcountry. But it's a bit finicky. So that's the problem. The other thing is I was wearing gloves inside my, uh, my big gloves, and I find that's a really good little trick. If you're going to be working outside, um, I'll have those thin gloves inside. It keeps my hands a little bit warmer. But also, when i got to take the big gloves off because I need to do fine motor skills, whether I'm taking photographs or I'm fixing something or I'm starting the stove, they're right there. And it really keeps my fingers from getting frozen. I always used to get frost nip on the tips of my fingers working with stoves and other things. You can pick these up at Canadian Tire. I think they're $1.50. Don't go and buy the expensive ones from uh, Black Diamond or anything. Because these work fine. And they're not going to last long. I prefer using a lighter over matches. I find matches are not very reliable in extreme cold or if they get damp. Lighters have a problem. They don't like the cold. But you just stick them inside your glove for a minute. And um, they always worked. I've used these in minus 30, minus 40. But they are susceptible to the wind. White gas would have just gone boom if this was summer because it was vaporizing. But in winter, I actually have to leave the light, the match on there for a few minutes to warm the fuel to the point where it ignites. So it's pretty nice. Yeah. So there's a couple of other uh, stoves out there. The current, uh, the current, um, I guess the you know the new shiny toy, are the um, the gas cartridges. I'm trying to remember what they're called. Uh, jet boil, I think it is. And those are using a compressed gas, and you just put the nozzle on top and light them, and they're good to go. Jet boils um, are limited in that the canisters, you know, you have to have a new canister every time you want. Uh, you run out, you can't just refill the tank when you get home. Uh, and they're not as fuel dense, not as energy as dense. But the advantage they do have is they're incredibly easy and they release their energy fast. You can just burn these things quickly and they can boil much, much faster. I'm actually looking at the idea of buying a jet boil and taking it with me on some trips. Um, it's a good idea to have two stoves actually, because if your stove breaks, that's the end of your trip. You got to go home because you're hungry. Um, and you can't get water. So stoves are pretty critical. It's nice to have a second stove, but the jet boil will melt snow much faster than these units. Um, and so I'm looking at that to see if it'll reduce my cooking time. So instead of sitting outside for, for two hours, I'll grab two stoves and be out for maybe a little under an hour a day. But it adds weight. Something to consider is, a you know, look at a second stove. And then you just work with this. Once it gets hot enough, you'll get that nice, clean blue flame, and you're good to go. Remember to keep pumping the unit up, because as the pressure drops, as it bleeds the fuel, um, it becomes less and less effective. It's not as hot. And so now you're sitting there longer, waiting for things to melt. The uh, copper coils that I put around the uh, stainless steel pot, they're not in vogue anymore, but you know what? I don't know how much it actually works as a heat exchanger, but I have noticed over the years that it's a pretty good tool to act as a windscreen. And I have played with it, and I find I get significantly faster boils using that heat exchanger. So it is something I've been carrying around for over 20 years now, and it's pretty reliable. The other thing is the big thing is just take your windscreen, wrap everything up nice and tight so the wind has less effect on it. 
Putting some water in the pot makes it a lot easier for the energy to be absorbed by the water because again if you throw snow on top, snow is an insulator, it's not a conductor and it takes quite a bit of energy before it begins to melt and then it's absorbed by the other snow and it doesn't really effectively transfer the heat from the stove into the snow and melt it. Things you learn after doing this for <laughs> 42 years. Actually more. Uh, 45. I am getting old. All right. And now you get to watch your pot boil. Meals in winter tend to be pretty basic. The one pot wonders are kind of the answer. Um, in summer, especially if we're going to huts, but in summer, my spouse is really good at coming up with some nice meals. And we go on long sea kayaking trips where we take all sorts of great, uh, great food. And even backpacking or climbing, you've got a little more flexibility. But in winter, if you're staying in huts, you got lots of options. I'll take a steak with me and bake potatoes, and I'll use the stove at the hut to bake the, uh, the wood fire at the hut to bake the potato. And the steak was frozen during the course of the day, so the meat's fine, and that's all great. But out here, I'll just take um, like a fresh tortellini, a bag of uh, pasta sauce. Kind of my favorite is um, uh, tomato sun-dried tomato pesto, and then just slice up a few pepperonis and some carrot and some broccoli and just have all that in a little Ziploc bag. So once the water boils, I pour in the uh, tortellini. Once the tortellini is warmed up, I throw in the veggies, just give it a minute, pour it out, squeeze on top the, uh, the pesto, mix it up, split it between myself and uh, whoever I'm traveling with, and that's dinner. Breakfast is almost always oatmeal, or it can be even something simpler. You can do cold meals. Uh, the big thing with the stove is you've got to melt water. And it is nice to have a warm meal at the end of the day. So they're useful, but it's a much simpler process than the rest of the year. You've just got to accept the fact that you're limited and go with uh, you know high caloric, simple meals. Uh, rice dishes work really well. The uh, boil and bag uh, freeze-dried foods or dehydrated foods work really well. There was a pad thai I was quite fond of. Uh, I don't know if it's still made. Happy Yak makes it. I think uh, MEC carried it. That was a nice one. And uh, so those are possible possibilities for meals. The other thing I like to do with my uh, stoves before bed is I like to melt as much water as I can because that way I need to melt less in the morning, which means I can get out and I can take off sooner. Because if you boil all the extra water you need and you go to the uh, the trouble of getting everything you want, I find even after I've got this dialed and I'm traveling with a really expense, uh, experienced partner, it's probably going to take me two hours from the time I wake up till the time I've broken camp and I'm starting to leave. It's a big process. So those are kind of some of the challenges you're going to be facing. And then the other thing I'll do with that, let's see if this comes up. Yes. Okay. Water bottles. I'll take uh, the hot water and I'll pour it into one of these Nalgene bottles. Uh, it's made of Lexan and I will stick it in my sleeping bag and use it as a hot water bottle. And once my spouse discovered this, basically all the hot water bottles went into her sleeping bag and all the liners went into mine. <laughs> but it was okay. Um, the other thing you can do is you can use a thermos. Now a thermos you don't need to put in your sleeping bag. Your water bottles Unless you're in a really warm environment, you're going to need to put your water bottles in your sleeping bag. So why not get them nice and hot, assuming you can afford the fuel, and just warm up your bag. It's wonderful. Gets your feet toasty, get a second one on your chest, and suddenly life's pretty good. To get a scent, and so they'll do that, I might even leave some water in the pot, knowing full well it's going to freeze, but now it's ice. So in the morning when I start it up, it very quickly absorbs the heat, turns to water, and I'm back in the game of melting snow. One of the things that's really important with this camp, and you saw me do it in the video, is I cooked outside the vestibule. You should never... Yeah, life-changing is... Uh, hot water bottles are life-changing, I agree. Um, one of the things that's really important is you should never cook in your tent, even if you've got vents. My tent has got three vents for, uh, for a stove. Don't use them. Cook outside. If you're building a shelter, you're in a snow cave or an igloo, 
cook outside. Even if you've got a hole punched in the ceiling, cook outside. And the reason for that is they did some experiments at altitude. And what they discovered is that over half of the people who were diagnosed with altitude sickness actually were suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning because they were cooking in their tents. And it was so much more obvious at altitude because they were desperate for air. And carbon monoxide basically locks up our blood and doesn't free it. Like it's not as soon as you stop the exposure, your lungs clear out. Carbon monoxide will hang on to your hemoglobin for hours or days. So it has a really strong detrimental effect. There has been a death in the Rockies attributed to carbon monoxide poisoning because they were cooking inside a snow cave. The, it was a couple and um, they had been cooking inside the snow cave. They turned it off, they went to sleep, and the snow cave collapsed and they were in such a uh, reduced mental capacity from the carbon monoxide that they were unable to get themselves out. Even though it wasn't that difficult an escape, they were unable, they didn't have the mental capacity to basically get out of a collapsed snow cave and they both died, they suffocated. But in the autopsy report, they found that the carbon monoxide level in their bloodstream wasn't enough to kill them, but it was pretty close. And so that is what prevented them from being able to save themselves. So between that report and that event, it's now just standard practice. Do not cook in your tent. Um, believe me, I love cooking in my tent. And three years ago, I was on the six pass and the temperatures were minus 36 in the evenings. And I was out there for four hours melting snow, cooking meals, and making hot water bottles for my guests. I was not in the tent. I was standing in the bitter, bitter cold. It's that serious, because believe me, there were a few places on it. There were a few risks I weren't willing to take to try and stay warm. So in terms of a fire, um, if you're below tree line, that's a possibility. If you're carrying a saw or you can find the materials, yeah, maybe you can make a fire. I don't tend to do much with fires though. And the reason for that is I don't find them all that effective. As you make a fire, it does warm up and it sinks through the snowpack. And what happens is your fire just keeps getting farther and farther away from you as it dives through the snow. This isn't a big deal if you're in the Rockies in a shallow snowpack, but otherwise it does become a problem. The other thing it does is it covers me with smoke and I smell bad enough after two or three days in the backcountry without the, uh, you know, the, the hickory smoke flavor on me. Also, that doesn't really warm me up that much. It'll sort of warm up my front, but not the back of me. And if there's a wind blowing, the sun, or the, the smoke and the, the sparks are always seen to be going in the wrong direction. And then finally, there's just the sparks. You get a spark on your coat and you burn a hole in it. So much of our clothing, um, all of our fleece, our Gore-Tex, everything is synthetic, it melts. And it's actually quite a big risk um, to have most of our clothing um, close to a flame source. During the Falkland War, the British uh, Navy were using um, the old synthetic Heli Hansen, and they were magnificent, magnificent insulators for mariners because they kept warm when they were wet and they were very light. But in a military application, as soon as there was any kind of a fire or intense heat, it literally melted onto the skin of the sailors. And the only way they could separate it was in the hospital to actually graft it off them. So be careful with synthetics around fire. Stove too, but uh, you know, a wood fire is a possibility. Done it a couple of times. I find it's generally more hassle than it's worth. But if you're freezing to death and you're soaked and you need to build a huge bonfire to stay warm through the night, well, yeah, that's what you do. Okay, but it's not something I, I, I embrace. So those are water bottles. What else have I got going? I'm sorry, folks, I don't know how I'm a little more organized, but it's been a really busy week. And so there's only so much I could do. What else have I got here? Uh, tent removing liners, vestibules, water bottles. Here's my new best friends. Booties. Despite having done this for decades, I just picked up a f my first pair of booties uh, a few years ago. You got to be careful in deep snow because the snow falls in. But if the area is packed out, booties are great. You get out of your main uh, ski boots. It feels so nice. Your feet dry out a bit. 
You can put these on and sleep with them if you want. Um, they're just really comfortable. And with that in mind, socks. Your socks will be soaked. Just from the insensible perspiration, and if you are working hard, you're going to be sweaty. Then there might be some snow melting that gets into your boots. And the liners in most ski boots now are almost airtight, so your sweat can't escape. It builds up in the boot. That's why your liners have to come into bed with you. And if I'm just out for a night, I might carry two sets of socks. And that way, with two sets of socks, I'm in a position where I just pull off the first pair of socks, they're wet, put them in a plastic bag, zip them tight, put them away, and then I put my socks on, my nice dry socks. I sleep in them, and the next morning I use them for the second half of my tour. If I'm on a long tour, like five, six days, I can't be carrying five or six pairs of socks. And what I do is I have two pairs of socks for the entire trip. And I will use the dry pair that I will ski tour in, and then when I get back at night, they're wet. I peel the wet socks off, I put them in the sleeping bag, and uh, basically either I let my body heat dry them out, or if I really got to push them through, I'll actually put my wet socks on in my sleeping bag, and I will literally just generate enough heat that by morning they're dry. And yeah, it's mildly disgusting, somewhat unpleasant. It's winter. You can only carry so much, you got to dry things out. I did a trip oh, back in the 80s where I went into a cave system for five and a half days underground. And the cave had a constant temperature of just above zero degrees Celsius. And during the day, you would work so hard, you'd be soaked with sweat. And in the evenings, when you went to bed, you were covered in the sweat. And you only, have one ch you only had one pair of clothes. But I would go to bed in my synthetics, wet and damp. And I would shiver for an hour or so. And then I'd finally have enough heat that I'd be able to fall asleep. And when I woke up in the morning, I was dry. So it can be done, it does work, but yeah, it's not always the most pleasant of, of things. You gotta remember, very few people go winter camping because it in itself is a sport. They go winter camping because it offers them the opportunity to go places that they wouldn't be able to access otherwise. And so you go winter camping because you wanna go up on the Columbia Ice Field and maybe climb the highest peak in Alberta or maybe you want to uh, tour across the WAPTA. And this winter, because with COVID, the huts are not a good idea, but you can tent it. And if you wait till you get into April or so, it's warmer, the days are long, and there's some decent places to go and camp. So go camp. You can still do the trip, but you're gonna be restricted in the amount of clothing you can carry, because you're gonna have a rope, you're gonna have a stove, you're gonna have to um, carry a bigger sleeping bag. So you balance things out. And on a sunny April day, you can lay damp things on top of your tent and the sun will dry them out. And even if it gets below zero, you can get a fair bit of action with freeze drying. So things like that can help. Um, something I didn't mention is how much fuel do you take? I do not know with the jet boils how long the cartridges last, but I can tell you that if you have uh, the standard bottle for uh, the white gas, and I'm we're using a whisper light, I burn about 750 milliliters for a weekend for two people. So two people for the weekend take one bottle. Uh, I'm going out for three days with some friends in January, and uh, I'll probably take two bottles with me. My son and I will be going along, and then uh, uh, there's two friends who are coming along, and so if we each have two full bottles, then that's plenty of fuel. Okay, let's see. Buy a knee-high overbooked better to work around and take when getting into test. Try vapor barrier socks, also keeps the inner, yeah. You can use vapor barrier socks for uh, for your ski boots, and for most people, that works. For me, it does not. I generate more heat and I sweat more than most people. Whenever I use a vapor barrier, basically the vapor barrier turns into a lake, which I can drain out and I can dry, but because my, so my feet are so constantly wet for so long, um, I tried this once and my feet were literally beginning to rot. Um, all the dead dried skin, because I have big calluses by spring, I'm in ski boots all winter. And the dead skin was literally beginning to rot and the stench, I just felt so badly for my partner. So it is something to consider, but if you have my issues, <laughs> be careful. Okay. All right, so,
with that in mind, let me see. I have another image here. Family Snow Cave. So this is my family. And I'm trying to remember, I think my son was six or seven. And he wanted to try winter camping. So I said, sure. And uh, this is a way, if you really want to just sort of figure it out and maybe start the idea of winter camping, what I would suggest is don't go on a 10-day ski traverse and learn how to winter camp because it might not go quite the way you planned. If you're out for a weekend, sure, that can work. But if you're a long ways off and you suddenly discover your sleeping bag is way too thin for your needs, you got a problem. Oh, your thermo rest has a leak. You didn't know about it because in the summer it wasn't a big deal. It's an issue. So my son and I, we just, uh, we were out in a backcountry. We were at a lodge that I used to manage. And during the day, we dug a snow cave. And uh, then that evening, we crawled in and we went to sleep. And he was actually quite cozy for most of the night. Um, so yeah, he and his whale and I were spent the night inside this, uh, this snow cave. That's another shelter. And snow caves are really good for several things. They're soundproof. They... Uh, are not affected by the wind. So if you get in a windy or exposed location, you can be up all night because the cold nylon has got this brittle flapping noise that will not let you sleep. Snow caves, they're soundproof. You will not hear the storm until you crawl outside. Another nice thing about snow caves is they are great insulators because snow is a brilliant insulator. Right up until about zero. And I remember doing a trip uh, with my spouse's family where we were planning to use uh, an igloo. We were going into an area where I could build an igloo. And as we skied towards there, the weather just deteriorated and it went to minus 28. And we had an emergency tent, so I pulled the tent out and everybody jumped in, got in their sleeping bags. And I was out there for several hours building an igloo big enough for everybody. And after I finished building the igloo, I took a temperature inside the igloo and outside the igloo. Outside, minus 28. Inside, it was minus 7. And it was quiet, and it was warm, and it was a whole different world. So snow caves can be a really effective tool. However, be careful. Snow caves, you will get soaked building. You'll get very wet. So be very careful when you build them um, not to kneel in the snow. Have something like a thermorest or a pad to, ne to kneel on so your legs and your pants don't get soaked. Your gloves will probably get soaked. I have yet to build a snow cave without completely soaking my gloves or my mitts. And so whenever I plan on using that type of shelter, I have an extra pair of mitts on top of whatever I would normally have so that I put them on and I use them for building the snow cave. And that way, when I take them off, you know, they're gone, but all my other regular ski gloves are there and they work fine because you won't get those dry on your trip. So be careful um, about getting wet. The best structure to build if you don't want to get wet is an igloo. They're lots of fun and they're great little engineering opportunities. However, they take practice. You cannot go out and build an igloo on your first try. So get out and build one close to a hut so you get comfortable with it. Build a couple and then when you sort of have it figured out, yeah, then you can go out. You're going to need a special kind of snow saw. They have to be longer than your regular snow saw. They tend to be a bit thicker and they cut snow really well. Um, unlike the ones you buy for, for avalanche stuff in snow study. The, um, the big limiting factor with snow caves and snow structures is time. They take time. Just to dig a simple hole is probably, you know, close to two hours. Unless you've got a really strong team and you know what you're doing. So it's something worth practicing in and around home. And the same thing is true with the snow caves. Because, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning, my son poked me in the snow cave and said, Dad, can we go in now? And I was like, okay. So I turned on a light. We crawled out of the snow cave. And it wasn't that he was too cold or anything. It just felt a little claustrophobic for him. I mean, he was just a little kid. And we walked 50 meters back to the lodge. He went into his bed, and I went upstairs and um, slept in our room. So... It's worth doing this close to home. When I was planning a big trip up north, I was testing various systems to see what would work for me. And I literally had my tent five meters from the door of my house. And I was going out in the most miserable nights I could imagine to test how things were working and to get through the night. 
I'm not soaked and I've got this, this is exit. But it allowed me to test various combinations with sleeping bags, with sleeping pads, and just to see what was going to work. So that's a really good way to start. It's somewhere, or someplace where you can get to a shelter pretty close. Um, snow cave, very soundproof. Be very sure to be able to find the entrance in a snowstorm. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I've been uh, buried in a few snow caves. We built a snow cave and um, the winds were blowing and so the entrance got sealed. We were fine inside. I mean, the snow has some breathability long as you don't try and start a stove. Um, just bring the shovel in with you because what I did is the next morning we couldn't get out. Our entrance was plugged. We just moved our sleeping bags to the back and I just dug straight up from the roof and we were out pretty quickly. But it also means your snow cave is no longer uh, a functional functional tool. But that's a good point. And also be careful when you're digging it. They can collapse. So again, practice them a bit before you're thinking, well, yeah, I'm just going to go out and build myself a snow cave because there's a little more to them. And that would be a course in itself. But this is kind of the basics. Um, so yeah, do you guys have any questions on basics? I won't get too much into snow caves. As I said, they're wonderful. Um, they're wonderful shelters. If I'm going to set up a base camp, I'm much more inclined to go with a snow cave just because um, they're so comfortable. And my favorite are igloos, but an igloo can take me four hours. So you've got to be careful. That's a lot of time. Oh, and there's one more thing. I wonder if I can play this. There we go. I apologize, I have not had the time to work on this, so it is not in any way, shape, or form um, edited. I, I shoot in a format called um, S-Log2, so it's missing most of what looks like should be its color. But believe it or not, it's actually pretty high quality. It just needs some post work. There I am. Okay. So let's check this out. It's nice to have an emergency shelter because tents can take a while and they're heavy. Snow caves are very light, but they require you to have the skill and the time to build them and also the conditions. You can't just build an igloo. You need the right snow. And the right snow is hard to find in the Rockies. Come spring up on the ice fields, I usually find good dense wind slab that'll work beautifully, but it's not something you're just gonna find. Snow caves are better, but again, you need deep snow. You probably want at least two meters snowpack and uh, fairly, fairly well compacted snow. Okay, this is what I carry for an emergency shelter. In my tiny little day pack. <laughs> my day pack just wasn't handy, so I used my, my overnight pack. It's just a tarp. And the tarp can be as simple as your old tent fly. What I've done is I just found uh, some coated nylon at, uh, in Calgary at Fabricland. That was like three bucks a square meter. Nice 200 gauge denier coated nylon. And I fold it, it in half, and I put some Velcro on each side so I can unwrap it and use it as a tarp. Or I keep the Velcro in place and I literally just sandwich myself in and I'm out of the wind. And I've got a little uh, window there that I can open up so I can breathe, but I can also see if the storm is still running. I'm sitting on my pack, I'm wiggling my toes. I'm actually in a pretty good position. Okay, a little out of sync. But I have used this on multiple occasions. Um, I was up on the Columbia Ice Field and we were building an igloo when we got hit by a big rainstorm. So igloos don't work in the rain. F uh, fun fact. And so three of us just sat on our packs inside this thing and it worked beautifully. You know, we were good for hours. It's not the most comfortable thing in the world, but it's a really quick, simple tarp if you're traveling with a group. And then you can split it, open it up, and it becomes a tarp if you want to build a lean-to and you're going to get a fire going below tree line. Um, I can fold it up, put somebody in the middle of it, roll the sides, and four or six people can actually pick that person up and we can just carry them like a stretcher. Or if you don't have the resources, you can just have two people and you can drag them. It works fine. Or if you have kids, give it to your kids when they're little and you'll buy yourself a nice quiet lunch because they'll just run off and play with it. And so using the heavier gauge nylon, this thing has lasted me 15 years so far. 
and there's a little hole I gotta fix, but otherwise it's still in good shape. Very simple, really quick emergency shelter, summer or winter. Okay, so are there any questions? Because as I said, I apologize. I just didn't have time to build a more detailed program and literally that first second video was processing while I was talking to you and showing you the first one. So it was a little tight tonight, but hey, it's free. Um, are there any questions? As I said, winter camping, you know, it can almost be fun come spring. You know, it's really nice. I remember doing a trip years ago. We were up on the uh, Caribou Traverse, Northern Caribou Traverse, and um, Comet, uh, Comet Hail Bop was in the sky. So every night as I finished uh, doing the dishes and packing up and getting ready to go in the tent, the sky would start to get dark and I could just see the most magnificent red-blue comet in the sky. And then I'd curl up in the sleeping bag and next morning we'd take off and we'd be moving through some really big, amazing um, ski mountaineering terrain. It's, it's pretty incredible. Two years ago on the Columbia Ice Field, I got to watch just one of the greatest uh, sunsets over Mount Columbia. And, uh, you know, they get you to pretty amazing places. And on a year like this, they'll allow you to get out for more than a day because the huts are pretty much limited. And, um, you know, we only have a few options left now. What are the dimensions again for the tarp? You know what? I'm not sure. It's about two meters by a meter, meter and a half folded. So that would make it um, about three by four meters. Tent pegs. You know what? I don't use tent pegs, especially not in winter. Whenever I see winter tent pegs, I figure it's a scam. Um, in the Rockies, we just don't have the kind of snow that you could use a, a winter tent peg in. So what I can, what you can do is, what I did with the tent, is I put a ski at the back and I put my two ski poles at the front, which is great if you're just there for the night. If you're gone, you're using it as a base camp, then every time you go skiing, basically your tent is unsecured. But what you can do is you can bury other things. If you took the bag from your tent um, and you filled it with snow and then you just tied it off and then you clove hitched that to a cord, which is then tied to your tent, you can use those very nicely. Little bags filled with snow, clove hitched, can make very nice anchors. If you're below tree line, just get a few sticks, you know, clove hitch them, bury them in the snow, pack it down, give them five minutes to set up, and they make really good anchors. So things like that can really help set your tent up. I think I forgot to mention, winter tents, I believe, should be freestanding. That way, they're pretty much independent on their own, and you just need to use anchors at the front and the back to stretch the tent out and keep the vestibule fully extended. Um, beyond that, uh, they're just keeping the tent from blowing away. So I don't use much for, for tent pegs. Favorite winter camping trips to bring kids? Oh, you know, someplace fairly close. Um, once COVID is over, any place close to a hut. So if you were to go to like the Elizabeth Parker hut or the Wheeler hut, you could build some snow caves for the kids and they could uh, basically jump in the snow caves. And if they're happy, they stay there for the night. And if they get cold or they just get a little nervous, they can run back into the, uh, you know, the hut and be, and be pretty comfortable. So I think those are really good places for kids, places that feel wild, but are pretty close to safety. And the parents can then have the choice of, do I want to join the child or do I want to wait here for them when they come back? Which is nice too. Um, winter camping is an acquired taste. Um, the Mosquito Creek Hostel used to be a brilliant place. And I'm sure they still let the, you do this. Is you go there and you build your shelter. And if you want to, you can use it, but you can also come in and you can warm up by the fire use the kitchen and there's a bed there for you if you want it. You do have to pay for the bed whether you're going to sleep there or not. But it just gives you that option and that security. You've got a great place and you're literally, you know, just 50 meters or 5 meters from the hostel. The one limitation is make sure it's a good snow year or go in late March or April 
when the snowpack is much deeper because there may not be a lot of snow there. So you're going to spend most of the day just shoveling snow, piling it up on top of itself. This is called a Quincy. Quincy's work, you pack them down, then you dig them out, but they're a lot of work uh, compared to a snow cave where you just dig in from the side of a, a wind roll or an igloo where you find the right snow and you just literally Lego it together. Yeah. So I hope that helps with, uh, with kids. Basically, yeah, just, just easy trips that get you back where you want to because I did take a group of children uh, ski touring once. Or not ski touring, but winter camping. And uh, about a third of them didn't make it through the night. And so basically I spent the night taking kids back and forth to a shelter where we had a good stove going and it was close to the road and they could just lay their sleeping bag down inside the shelter if temperatures are well above zero and they felt a lot more comfortable. But those who were comfortable with staying out longer, they did. So it works. Any other questions? No? Okay. Well, listen, folks, thank you very much. This is the last of the four-part series. And as I said, I, I apologize. I didn't have more put together, but it's just been a, it's been a crazy week. I seem to work more in COVID than I did uh, before, um, just getting everything ready to go or preparing materials. So I just didn't have an opportunity to, to get this a little more structured. So thanks. Take, take care, guys. If you have any questions, I think my email was up there. You're happy to send me an email. Uh, a bay about five kilometers at Malim Lake with an enclosed picnic shelter for cooking. Okay, I'm trying to think where that is. There are a couple of uh, campsites along Malim Lake um, for the summer with canoes, and they might have, have structures, yeah. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, so thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure. All right, any comments about tent pegs? Favorite winter camping spots? Thank you, thank you. Okay, it's my, oh, hey, Dave. It was my pleasure, thanks, guys. The biggest thing with winter camping, though, is don't sweat. Stay dry. And that usually means peeling off layer after layer while you're touring. And then when you stop, you can throw them all on because you won't generate a lot of heat when you're setting up camp. And you'll be drier, and that makes a huge difference. A snow cave session would be great. Yeah, I'll try to get some material. You can reserve in winter. Okay. Oh, campsites in winter at Jasper. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. Jasper's also got some good huts. And you can use those as well. Just be careful. Jasper is a little different than Banff. I lived there for about 15 years in Jasper. More than that over the years. But... Um, the snowpack in Jasper tends to be fairly thin, so it's hard to find enough snow for snow caving. You can snow camp easily enough. And because it's thinner, the snow facets out, and it's really hard to find good places to dig shelters. Um, or for, for igloos, it's really tough. Now, just across the way from Jasper into Robson Provincial Park would be amazing snow once you get up towards Mount Robson. And beyond that, uh, up onto the ice fields. The Brazo and the Columbia Ice Field also have really good snowpacks, and they're, they're in Jasper National Park as well. Yeah. So thanks, everybody. Take care. And hopefully I'll see you in the mountains. Okay, so, oh. favorite multi-day snowshoe trips. Um, I'm the wrong person to ask because I'm a ski guide. We have to take a secret oath to never support or endorse snowshoes. Endorse snowsho but about once every four or five years, I end up in a situation where snowshoes are the only option and I, I use them. But to be honest, I don't really know snowshoeing all that well. Look online and uh, see if there are some good uh, reports for snowshoes or snowshoes or snowshoeing. Um, 
Check with the Cavell Hostel. The area up there might work well for snowshoes. It's only about 12 kilometers. And there may be an opportunity to do some snow caving in and around there. Um, they do close the road for part, at least part of the winter for caribou habitat. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I'm sorry, I don't know. That, uh, that's just not my world, so I, I wish I could help, but I don't. Okay, much of Jasper is closed until, yeah, February 15th for caribou. Yeah, yeah, check on the closures. I believe it's primarily just the Tonquin. I don't know what else is closed now because they have been making updates for, uh, for the caribou conservation. But if you're living in Edmonton, it's almost the exact same distance to drive to get to Banff as it is to get to Jasper. And I say this as a former Edmontonian because I know the rivalry, but it is, they're pretty much almost as close. And, oh, actually, you know what? For snowshoes, you might be able to snowshoe up to uh, the Takaka Falls campground. And then I think you can camp there, whether you're using a tent or you're going to try and look for snow. There's also a shelter there where you could get a fire going. So that might be useful as well. All right. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. Take care. Have a good winter. And uh, I hope... Uh, Hopefully we'll run into each other on uh, in the backcountry. And I'm going to shut her off. Oh, Tonquin, Brazil, Moline, Drainage. Wow, that's interesting because the Moline has no more caribou. And the Brazo has no more caribou. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's sad. 20 years ago, that would have made sense. Okay. All right, thanks, guys. Take care.